Hi, I'm Daniel Wordsworth. For more than 30 years, I've experienced war zones, natural disasters, refugee camps, and sprawling slums. Now I'm going to show you a better and more optimistic world. This podcast is Finding Good. Today I want to talk about the fact that the best lies that we tell are the lies that we tell ourselves. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> they're actually, I'm listening. Or you listen, yeah, no one ever likes this one. So I'm, <laughs> I am going to explain it a bit. It, they're also the worst things you can do. So there's the best lies are the lies you tell yourself, but the worst lies are also those lies. So what I'm talking about here is cognitive dissonance. For, now, those, for those playing along at home, explain Yeah, what does that mean? Distance. So what it basically, I think most of us think that we're seeing the world in an objective way. And the idea of cognitive dissonance is that actually we don't see the world in an objective way. That actually we're filtering the world that we see through the stories that we tell ourselves. So actually what we've got going on is a story about the way that we see the world. Mm -hmm. And then we look at the world and we actually force the world to fit into our story. And when the world doesn't fit our story, we bend and we twist and we reshape the world to correspond with our story. So mm -hmm. the idea of cognitive so cognitive dissonance is when you're looking at a thing and it doesn't fit the way you think that thing should be. I know smoking is bad for me, yet, and I see that smoking can cause cancer, yet I believe that I'll, I will need to smoke so I'll smoke because I'm not going to get cancer. Smoke is a tough one because that's an addiction. Oh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Boom, I just blew that idea so, out of the water. Uh, well, I'm going to show you actually today three examples of cognitive dissonance. Okay. I'm actually going to show you the most – I've just and I've seen these in the last week or so. I'm going to show you what I think is the most breathtaking and one of the purest examples of cognitive dissonance that you'll ever see. It's um, – I think I heard another on another podcast someone said somebody was uh, virtuosically negative. Uh, this person is the, – they're a virtuoso of cognitive dissonance and that's Joe Rogan. Mm. So I'm going to actually give that as an example. You're take on the biggest podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the idea – but here's the key thing. We think that we see the world, that we may have a story in our head and that we see the world and we when we see something that contradicts our story, I think we think – that we're just rational, reasonable people and that we just change our story to, you know, go along with what we see as reality. Hmm. But that's not what happens, that we have a story and then when we see the world and the world doesn't fit the story, we change the way we see the world. So this, there's an example of Joe Rogan. So um, I'm going to play the clip and it is um, oh, it's just stunning. He's talking about the Revolutionary War. He's like, one of the reasons why we lost the Revolutionary War, one of the problems with the Revolutionary War was they didn't have enough airports. Yeah. <laughs> have you seen that? I saw that. <laughs> like, what that? The Like, hell? pull him. This is crazy. If, if, you were, if you had any other job <laughs> and you were talking like that, yeah. they would go, hey, you're done. If you talk like that to a doctor at your yeah. medical exam for to fight, they'd yeah. be like, okay, like obviously <laughs> you're not fighting. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. would also here's you know eight weeks of of uh, being helped out by a professional like right you, <laughs> you might not ever do anything again. no it's yeah. a, it's it's one of the wildest things ever it's insane the same stable genius who said the biggest problem we had in the revolutionary war is we didn't have enough airport <laughs> whoa <laughs> Sorry, yeah that's it whoa right. just, <laughs> what just for for the record is that <laughs> fake it's not fake. But he was referencing Trump saying that. Here's what Trump saying it in 2019. Oh. Donald Trump said something about that. He didn't say G Jesus. He said a stable genius, and that's where the, oh. the transcription. Let me hear what it says. What did he say? <clears throat> in June of 1775, the Continental Congress created a unified army out of the revolutionary forces encamped around Boston and New York. Our army manned the airports. It ran the ramparts. It took over the airports. It did everything it had to do. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So he f***ed up. <laughs> yeah, he did. But I feel like <laughs> that's it. Just, you can yeah. tell, too, it sounds like a little different. He's like, you can tell he, like, messed up his words. But yeah. yeah. Right. So they started off by suggesting that Joe Biden couldn't be president because he claimed there were airports during the Revolutionary War. Right. And they believed that because they heard that clip in isolation. Oh, that they went a step further. They said that because Biden said that there were airports in the Revolutionary War. Not only was he disqualified from the job of president, 
But one of those guys, the the sort of laughing fool that's on that show, <laughs> the he, me, <laughs> that, that, he was. Uh, I think he's an MMA, MMA guy, right? He's not the producer. Yeah. But uh, he was like, actually, you'd have to have. I think it was eight days of mental health yeah. assistance, and then I think Rogan says. That, that thinking that there'd be airports in the Revolutionary War would just disqualify you in general from life. Yeah. Yep. So that's how bad it is to think that. Yeah. And then their producer very nervously steps in and says, um, yeah. actually it was Trump that said that. He was just quoting him. He was just quoting him, <laughs> the stable genius. And instantly, instantly, they were like, oh, he just messed up and he didn't really mean it. And it's just a Yeah, words he's stumbling over his words. He's just stumbling over his words and and uh, nothing. It, not even a second's pause to say, actually, we were the ones that messed up. Hmm. Actually, now I'm really confronted by this. Well, where's his eight weeks of mental health where's, help? <laughs> where's his eight? Well, I wonder if that disqual... Surely on a podcast I should have consistency that covers... Four sentences in a row. Yeah. <laughs> right? I get it. You may have week to week, you may go up and down a bit. Yeah. I think he's famous for that. But being inconsistent through four sentences, pretty stunning. Yeah. So then you'd have to ask the question, is this guy just a liar? Is it a lie? Does he know exactly what he's doing and is he lying? You mean Joe Rogan? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I don't think he is. Now, I'm going to give an example. The next example I'm going to give cognitive dissonance is a lie. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when people we think are doing cognitive, they're just lying. Right. <laughs> right. They're just manipulating. Um, but then I'm going to give a third example where another example of our own cognitive dissonance. But uh, no, I think in this instance, it was a pure example that he suddenly saw the world in a way that didn't fit his story. And so mm -hmm. he just changed the way he saw that world. And he did it so automatically and so instantaneously that he had no control over that, it was unconscious. That's what we're getting at with cognitive dissonance. And that's not a thing, and, and my other point would be is um, we're all doing this. We all think we're seeing the world honestly and objectively. Yeah, everyone has an unconscious bias. Well, we have biases, we have a whole bunch of things that we're running stuff through, but I think what I'm getting at is what's the bias to? Now, you might say it's to race or privilege or something, but what I'm implying here is the greatest bias that we have is the bias to the story that we're telling ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis. That's our fundamental bias. And it's so powerful that it can show up in five seconds, four sentences. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's what uh, Joe Rogan was a victim of. The other guy is just a victim of, what's the what do you call yes men? Like just grinning you know, just going along. Like, did you see a thing that didn't happen? Yes, I just saw that, yeah. right? That's a different thing. Yeah. But Joe was a, in cognitive dissonance, I think, um, and I choose to believe that about him. Um, but I'm not going to listen to his podcast anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised you even did. <laughs> well, I hear that on my TikToks. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the second example? What's so the, the second example was I was reading an article in the New York Times and the New York Times was quoting and it was talking about an earnings call by the chief financial officer of a U.S. company called Walgreens. Mm -hmm. Now, Walgreens in the U.S. is a bit like what we would call chemist warehouse. Yeah, they're here. like a pharmacy. They're like a pharmacy, but also they sell a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. Yep, so they're big stores and they're all over the place like chemist warehouse is here. You can't go like, you know, three or four blocks in the U.S. without hitting a um, Walgreens. So the CFO was on there and he was like, you know, mea culpa, we may have, I think his words were, we may have cried a bit loud about shoplifting. Now, to give you the background, this he made this earning call in uh, 2023, but he was referencing something that happened in 2021. Now, what Walgreens did is Walgreens got national coverage, hit the headlines, because they said, we are going to close five stores in downtown San Francisco because, quote, unquote, organized theft is so serious that we can no longer run these stores. We can no longer make a profit. We can no longer function economically. That this organized theft is so bad that we need to close these five stores. Now, this hit sort of national news. Now, mm. San Francisco is famous in the US for having a homeless problem. Yeah, but how much stock would you have to be losing? So here's, <laughs> here's the question, right? Because he's implying, 
And and the I think they carefully use the word organized. That it's like somebody's back in a trucker, right? They must be back yeah, in a trucker. Taking pallets of, of stuff. stuff. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they had closed five stores because of this. Now, then what happened is there was a viral video that happened of somebody with some stolen thing, and then a whole bunch of other companies started saying, you're right, uh, theft is endemic everywhere, and we're going to have to shut our stores from inner city areas, minority areas. Then what happened is the police showed their data. Right. One of the stores that closed in the year 2021, the year that this guy made this announcement, had seven thefts. So you imagine a store twice the size of an average chemist warehouse had seven thefts. That's not like they have a theft problem. That's the exact opposite of that. I think they had a total of 28 thefts over a five-year period. They're lying. Yep. Now then, and then you have all of these other folks that are saying, oh, we're all experiencing terrible retail theft. So in in this article in the New York Times, they actually go to a guy that's done the analysis on it. At the percent of theft, it's what it's called is shrinkage. So they call it inventory shrinkage. So the, and within that, theft is a portion of that. But also if something breaks or if a, a package is open or is faulty or something, that's all inventory shrinkage. So they know the average amount across retail outlets across the whole US, they know the percent of stock that is lost because of shrinkage. And it is on average 1.5%. And of that 1.5%, of that is from theft. So that means they're losing about 0.4% of their entire inventory to theft every year. And yet everybody's crying in downtown areas and minority areas that they can't operate because of theft. Now, they're telling us a story. Now, you say, what's under this story? Because no one's closing these retail stores in nice suburban areas. Mm. Yeah. So they're just withdrawing from these areas. Now, what happened in the case of San Francisco is after this, when this coverage hit, there was a recall election and there was a progressive uh, politician in San Francisco that had been voted in and they were on like reform and helping homeless people and reforming their downtown. That person got recalled and was taken out, was uh, lost their uh, seat in San Francisco around this time. So there's a real impact from this. So sometimes, so we hear a story, and I would get at this, there's a story being told to us. It's a story that's being told to us in Australia and it's being told to us globally. The theft is a real issue for retailers, that it particularly happens in uh, minority areas and downtown areas, Mm -hmm. that it's organized in some way, so it's done in a very systemic way, and that it's causing these companies to no longer be able to function. And we know it's not true. It's just not true. Mm -hmm. And yet it has an impact on the way we think about downtown areas. It has an impact on the way that we think about minorities. And so we have that ruminating around. And so you have one group of people where we're experiencing the cognitive dissonance, but they're just using this story to explain why they don't want to operate in those areas. Maybe they're not as profitable. Who knows? Now, I have a third example that's more tied to us and is also connected to the U.S., And I was just reading, it was in Forbes, um, published this. And they said that in the last five years, the analyst that did this, and it was over 175 cities in the US. So that'd be most of the metropolitan areas. There's been what he called a historic decline in crime. So in the last few years, there's, it's the most historic decline in crime that we've experienced. Does that include the two COVID years? Yeah. Right. Well, it, it's from the COVID years into now. Well, okay, everyone was locked up. Yeah. <laughs> but it includes also the last two or three years. Okay. Actually, there was um, an initial spike in the early parts of the COVID. But uh, in the last two years, no, it's a historic decline. And in three of the major cities that are seen as the crime hotbeds, Los Angeles, New York, and in particular Chicago, right? If you live in the US, people bring up Chicago all the time as this sort of hellhole, a crime-ridden neighborhood. And yet in Chicago, they had a 12.7 decline in murder rates just in the last 12 months. So in all of those areas, there was a double-digit decline, a decline in murder, but a decline overall in crime. Mm -hmm. So the situation is better much better, historically better, actually. And yet all of us think what? 
Crime's going up. We all think crime's going up. Yeah. I think it's got to be something to do with – because I think it's about cognitive dissonance because what I also do know Do we want is, to believe that crime's going up? Do we want to believe yeah, the so, world's yeah, getting so worse? Yeah, so this is the, the question I think we need to explore now is why do we want to believe this? Or, or maybe another way to put it is why are we choosing to believe this? Because I think a key starting point is if we accept that we live in a world where facts still exist, the fact is the crime – is historically declining. That's the fact. Mm -hmm. 175 cities across the US. Now, there'll be people that'll be listening to this saying one of two things. Not in Australia, right? Yeah. But you really think that Australia's, you know, our rep is worse than downtown Chicago? I wouldn't have thought so. Or, uh, you know, <laughs> come on. And, and uh, it's 175 cities. So it's a broad... Uh, piece of analysis. Yeah. So there's a part of us that if you're sitting there going, yeah, but that's not Australia or that's not Austria or wherever you are, I would just put a little pin in that. And then I would go, oh, there's an interesting thing that you should explore. Yep. Why do you instantly go there? Uh, but secondly, somebody might just say, no, but I just feel like it's not declining. So the echo chamber, I mean, you know, the social media news feeds, etc. cetera, you, you get more of the content that you consume. So are people perhaps seeing more stories than they were before about crime? They're not seeing the relevant information. The crime stats have gone, you know, the stats say the crime has gone down. Do we naturally lean towards drama? You know, I know news services do. Drama is entertainment mm. and entertainment sells. So you came out of that uh, world. Yeah. Is that true? Oh, uh, well, yeah, conflict is drama and drama is entertainment. That's that's day one since people first stood on stage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I, know, I know for a fact that negative stories and stories that create fear and confirm the bias that we believe things are bad always get better clicks. Mm. Always get better clicks. Good news stories don't. Guy saves puppy from tree. No one's clicking on that. But, you know, five youths rob people at gunpoint in their cars in suburban Melbourne gets clicks. I need to know where that was. I don't know enough to know if that's true, but I wonder if it is. I know that we think that's true, but I live, I live in my own little world, right? I, I, watch, I love TikTok, and I'm forwarding stuff onto my daughter all the time, and I never send her the bad stuff. I send her the stuff about cat and dog videos, typically. <laughs> <laughs> or like there's this parrot that swears, like yeah. really, he's like a <laughs> sailor. I send that parrot things all the time. It's like I don't... I want to give her pleasure and laughter and things, and I find it easy to do that. I would never send her anything really negative. But so I, I wonder if that's what we're sharing on our TikToks and our Insta Reels and everything else is all about stuff, whether or whether actually what we're sharing is more often than not something fun, something inspirational, something nice. There was an that's, article in The Guardian, I think it was you know, the start of the year, you know, one of those New Year things 45 things you can do this year to change the way you live. And the first thing was choose your first thought and last thought every day. So perhaps people are choosing to think, confirm their bias, the world is a bad place. Things are happening that are out of my control. It's going to hell in a handbasket. Um, they're not choosing to see, as it, back to your very first episode, that the world is abundant mm -hmm. and that there are good things happening in the world. They just... Yeah, so I went out and picked one classic guardian that they do 45. Of course. <laughs> I know. I was like, we could have just stuck with five. <laughs> we could have had five. Classic guardian, 45. In the, on the progressive and the left side, they always think that complicated is good. Yeah. Oh, you just don't understand. Give me if five you, If you understood, you know, you would believe and think the same way that I do. five things. <laughs> What I'm getting at here is it's not a – we think we're choosing stuff. But more often than not, it's not a choice. That actually what we're doing is we're seeking and looking for things that fulfill the story that we have. So what's determining this, the choices that we're making, it's not like we sit on TikTok and say – or on Instagram or somewhere else, I want to see 30 things in a row that are really negative because I'm a negative kind of guy. Mm. We don't think that. We don't choose that. TikTok's just really good at showing us stuff that reinforces what we want to see. Yeah. So when I scroll it through, almost everything's positive, right? Because yeah. I'm a positive guy. When you send a cat guy. video to your daughter, it's, you know you're just going to get a whole bunch algorithm. of cats. No, she's yeah. going to get a whole bunch of cats. <laughs> I've already put that. I know she likes cats and dogs. So I, I, I think this is what I, I'm getting at. And actually, it's something that I'm weaving through all of these podcasts is the world shows up to us truly in the way that we want it to. And then you would say, well, want is a really difficult word. 
And then I would say, I mean that in the context of the story that we're telling about what we want. So we create a story in our mind and then we force the world to conform to that. And even when the world doesn't, we force it to. And I would just say we need to be aware that there are kind of like three things out there. There is a person like uh, Joe Rogan who is obviously pushing a kind of a right-wing agenda. It just got revealed in that moment Mm. because when he had to pick between two politicians, he picked to see the positive thing in the right-wing guy. Now, I don't have a either way. What I'm talking about is the cognitive dissonance that Joe Rogan experienced, not whether Trump or Biden or whatever. But uh, so there's certain people that are pushing an agenda politically to us and uh, that's coming through. There are also certain people that are actively manipulating us for economic ends, the case of Walgreens. And then thirdly, we just have our own story that it feels like crime's getting worse. It feels like the world is worse today than it was 10 years ago. And because of that feeling that we have, we make the world conform to that. So we're bringing that. But you know, one of the interesting things that we did at World Vision is in 2021, we felt, and what everybody was saying was that because COVID was happening, because everybody was in lockdown, most nonprofits thought that giving and donations would, would shrink. They thought that people, uh, I mean, a lot of people lost their work, that you had people that were fearful for their own lives and the lives of their families, very focused on their own communities and their own neighbors. And so nonprofits felt like there'd be a big decline in donations. And so in World Vision in 2021, we were experiencing the opposite of that. We were actually seeing growth in donations. And so we did this little piece of research and we, um, using our, our database, and we tested, were people more generous during COVID than they were before it? Now, Australians are always generous. So this is just a difference in degree, mm. right? But what we discovered was t- two things, two things that are really lovely. One is absolutely not. Actually, Australians were more generous during the COVID period. And what was curious about that was that the areas that were most locked down, places like Melbourne and suburbs and things like that, that were most locked down in different parts of the country, actually saw the greatest growth in their giving. Really? Yeah. So it did the exact opposite to what everybody thought it would do. The other thing that's really nice that we discovered was that Australians are universally generous, meaning um, you, you There's no state, there's no city, there's no suburb, there's no country town, there's no area that votes one way or another that's more generous than another. It's like Australians universally, whether you're in a country town in South Australia or in a suburb in Sydney, we pretty much give in the same levels. Not, I don't mean the amount, right, because that changes based on the sort of economic situation of that area, but the sort of percent of income and things like that, it's basically the same. Uh, So it doesn't really matter left or right, rural, city. Australians are just sort of universally generous in this way. But it was another example of where we thought something would go one way and it didn't. And we were telling ourselves a story about the Australian people that didn't turn out to be true. And uh, so if I tie it back to the beginning of the podcast, when I say the most important lies or the best lies are the lies that we tell ourselves, I'm just, I'm really overstating things. I I don't really mean lies. What I mean is that we have to pick a story. We have to choose a way that we're going to look at the world. We have to pick a story about what we think people are like. We have to pick a story about what we think Australia is like or the country that we live in is like. We're going to have to pick a story about what we think our neighbours are thinking. So if you're writing a story about the world... Mm. Choose to write a comedy or a nice one, write a fun (laughs) one. Don't write a great tragedy. (laughs) Where everything bad happens to you the whole time, don't? Is it, what is it? Just some of those dreadful Shakespeare ones with, uh, you know, the whole King Lear, yeah. you know, <laughs> with my eyes plucked out. And don't do all that. Yeah, write much ado about nothing. Instead. Right. Write something beautiful. Write something inspirational. Write something. And what I've got out in the last, also in the podcast, is the world will then show up that way. And you, and even if it doesn't, you'll force it to. That's the point of cognitive. Even if the world's trying to be good. You're going to make it suck if you think it's sucking. What's the research that was done around the car? You know, the, when you, when uh, yeah, the, that, I, I think it's called the Honda Accord effect yeah. or the Honda Civic. I decided Civic. to buy the Honda Accord. Yeah, so you like never see, I see them everywhere. Exactly. Yeah. You never see a Honda and then it's this is like it I is a psychological test. We've talked about it. 
that you never see a Honda Accord until you buy one and then you notice every third car's a Honda Accord. And, and what we talked about in that other episode was it wasn't like that Honda had them all stuck in a warehouse and at the moment Fitz bought one they were like unleashed the horde, right? It wasn't like that. <laughs> they were always there. But you train your eyes on what you want to yeah. see and that's what we're getting at with the story. That works for everything but car parks, by the way. So you know, I just for a car park, you can't find one. It's, it works the opposite way. I discovered something amazing. I've always said that my great superpower when I lived in the US was my ability to get car parks. I always got the best ones. <laughs> then I came to Australia and I couldn't get a single car park. And then my daughter is with me on this trip. I got the best car parks. Oh, this is another classic. <laughs> All the way along, I thought it was me that had the superpower. But it was her in the back of the car. <laughs> and it totally worked. We might need to unpack that one <laughs> on a separate podcast. Uh, if you um, like the podcast, please like it on your uh, preferred podcast platform and share it with your friends. Please leave a comment uh, in the comment section as well. It just helps other people discover the podcast. And you can follow Daniel on his socials, Daniel Wordsworth. Thanks, Daniel. We'll talk to you again.